You're listening to JTE Movie Thinks. Is that is that the title? Is that is that correct grammar? All right, we'll go with it. It's a show about movies and thinking. And now here's your host, every man's hero, JTE. Hey guys, welcome back to JTE Movie Thinks Podcast. Back again. That's our second episode of 2018. The podcast is back. Thanks to you guys. Go ahead and do me a favor. Jump on to Patreon. Uh, that's right. My guest today, first of all, is Spencer Gilbert. Oh, hey. And yes, I, hello. I can see Go to Patreon. <laughs> I was like, are you judging me because I'm charging people? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, 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 we, uh, I'm, I, I'm just feeling extreme amounts of guilt because I guess Screen Junkies doesn't uh, doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> they totally pay the bills, uh, but unfortunately, you know, I, I want to get better equipment and stuff. Hell yeah! And because I, I have a full time job with Screen Junkies, you know, I need some uh, other venues of avenues of money. Yeah, and go to uh, uh, my Patreon, which should be set up by the time uh, that this episode is over, because uh, I, I have an addiction to um, expensive uh, food, so uh, help me eat uh, pizza with caviar on it. I will say this, as someone who works with you and sees lunch get delivered pretty often... It's my one indulgence is, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I eat a lot of uh, crazy crap, and it's delicious, and uh, you know what? Who needs uh, uh, anything else? You know what? Because I here's the thing. When I see your food delivered... I could tell by the bag it comes in that it's not a cheap lunch. Mm-mm. It's not Mm-mm. like, you know, a, there's the bags that look like, you know, your mom gave you every morning. She put your lunch in. It's all wrinkled and tough. Yours come in. It looks like almost something you would receive as you're walking out of a wedding. You know like what? A I'm, gift not, bag of, or so. I'm not a, what I describe as a wealthy man. I'm not a, uh, I'm not the 1%, but I am lunch rich. Okay. And while, <laughs> in, while I'm working at Screen Junkies and I'm officially lunch rich, I'm going to ride this out. <laughs> I'm going to get you know the what? nice Subway sandwich, not okay. from Subway, but from the nice sub sandwich shop. I'm going to get the personal pizzas okay. until this gravy train <laughs> runs out. Let me ask you this. What sir, do you use? Uh, di- was it Diner Dash? There's Grubhub, Postmates, Uber Eats. What's your go-to? A little of all uh, of oh, all okay. the above, but um, uh, I'm a Postmates Unlimited person, so I do oh, get free delivery. get free delivery. Yeah, uh, so piggyback on this one day. I might have to. Yeah. Holy crap. <laughs> all right. Well, you know what? You just This has been Lunch Talk <laughs> That's, uh, at that Defy is your, Media. Uh, that is your contribution to my Patreon. <laughs> okay. Yeah, <you laughs> a free it. delivery once in a while for lunch. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so, yeah, guys, I do have a Patreon with my girlfriend, April. Uh, go on there. There's some really fun stuff. We give you exclusive podcasts, exclusive videos, and you get to be a guest on this very podcast. At the very end of this episode, I let one of my Tier 3 Patreons record a two, three-minute Basically, audio file of the last movie they watched, a little mini review, mm. and I plug it at the end of this episode, and it's a lot of fun. I've been having a lot of fun with it so far. That sounds awesome, yeah. I'm curious to see if they're any good. I'm sure they're great if they're listening to this. They're, uh, they you. know their movies. <laughs> so, guys, if you haven't listened to the show before, I did realize I got some new uh, listeners last week, uh, two weeks ago, when I did my first episode in a long time, mm. uh, because for, I was on for, you know, for over a year almost, and I had a pretty good following, but then I kind of fell off, went to YouTube, and I... So this year I want to do more content, so I said let's bring the podcast back. A lot of people were asking me for it. Uh, so if you're listening to this, so basically I have somebody on a guest, a friend of mine, somebody I work with, so I'm able to you know talk and to come and actually talk to me. And I say, what's the last movie you watched? And let's talk about it. I have no idea what you watched last. Mm. I go. I, I usually go off the fact that I've seen most things. Yeah. But there are times where I've had people on this show. How Rudnick, when I had him on the show, mentioned some like documentary or from like 19. 19- 60s, oh. and I had no idea what okay. he was talking about. Yeah, so, no, mine's not obscure in the slightest. Um, uh, I'm just, uh, in fact, I'm worried that somebody might have already talked to you about it. Oh, well, since the podcast has not been going on for a while, I think you're going to be safe. Okay. <laughs> but who knows? It could be somebody I talked about. I honestly don't remember every single movie I talked about when it comes to like my mm. guests, but let's hear it. What's the last movie you watched? Now, this could be whether something you saw on a theater, a screener at this time. It could be something you threw on Netflix or something you have on your shelf that you love and you just threw it in again because you want to watch Look, I'm ashamed to admit this. Oh, okay. Because I've been catching up on the movies I missed in 2017. Oh, okay. And I saw this as a screener. Okay. I did not purchase a ticket, which is something that I do recommend after having seen it. Oh. And what I had heard and everything. Enough suspense. I finally saw Dunkirk. Oh, crap. Oh, <laughs> wow. This is fun because we've been asking you if you watched Dunkirk for a while here in the office. Yeah. I will, before we get into your thoughts, yes. I did a review for this movie earlier this year. I did not love the movie. Mm. Um, I liked it as a technical, like, just as a pure production value. Sure. Uh, the skill of the filmmaking that went into it, I was impressed. 
I didn't love the movie because I never found that I was really able to attach myself to anybody. And I've had people on Twitter tell me that's not the point. You're not supposed to like be attached to this character. You don't really, I don't think they even give you the names of most of the characters in this movie. You're just kind of thrown into this weird time lapse battle scenes. And so that was my original take on the review. Now I've talked to friends of mine who I thought would love this movie Mm. and they were just okay with it. I've talked to friends who I thought were going to not like this movie and they loved it. Mm. So I am super curious to hear where Spencer Gilbert falls on the Dunkirk beach. (laughs) I guess I, it's hard for me to even say good or bad, except to just say I'm fascinated by this movie. Okay. Because there's things that are good about it, and there's things that are bad about it. But I also think, like, it's almost unfair to compare it to other films. It feels like an experimental video, like or a, a video essay about a war event, more so than, like, your traditional narrative. Um, Ex- it, elaborate on that. <laughs> it seemed like an experiment in creating tension. For me. Okay. Uh, and, and in the like build up and release of tension of just the whole score and the ticking clock mm-hmm. and uh, everything they do is set up for you to like feel just to get increasingly and increasingly tensed up until there's finally a release at the end. Um, it, it, the, the fact that you never really see the enemy the entire yeah, time that's is something. incredibly paranoid <laughs> that I mm-hmm. made that word up uh, it, it just makes you so paranoid and it really puts you in the shoes of uh, I hesitate to say characters of, uh, to put you in the <laughs> yeah. shoes of the people who were go uh, who were going through that event which is also something that I had no idea about I'd never heard of Dunkirk I'm not British and yeah. I'm not a big World War II historian um, but it was fascinating for me to, to revisit that time that event which I knew nothing about and you know, just the just the small details of of uh, you know Tom Hardy right, calculating the amount of gas he had left. Mm-hmm. Everything was just winding you and winding you and winding you and winding you um, uh, until the finale. So uh, I thought, in that respect, it was incredible. Again, I couldn't tell you what any of the characters' names were. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there were a bunch of uh, younger uh, British gentlemen and a, a few older British gentlemen, yep. and they were kind of similar. Um, so, which makes me think that you're not supposed to evaluate the film on that level. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wonder if, uh, just trying to imagine the alternate version of Dunkirk where like, you do learn about those guys and like, here's my, my, here's my family (laughs) back home, man. I'm a day away (laughs) from retirement. I don't think that necessarily makes it a better movie. I agree with you. And this is where I struggle with the movie. I think. Nolan accomplished exactly what he wanted to accomplish. Yeah. I don't think, I agree. He's not like, I'm going to put this character in there who you see uh, grow up on a farm and then all <laughs> of a sudden goes off. This ain't Heartbreak Ridge, or not Heartbreak Ridge, Hacksaw, Hacksaw Ridge. Okay. Heartbreak I Ridge. Did is not, I like this a lot better than that one. Okay. Forrest Gump goes to war. <laughs> yeah, Forrest Gump goes to war. So, like, I do understand that's what he went for. But while I do think it's a very tense film, I do think it's very well shot. In a way, it felt like a really expensive reenactment. Like, remember when you used to go, like, to the <laughs> to like the well, fields. Maybe you did. Well, no, I, guess, I know. That, I know that that's a thing. Yeah, I grew up in Connecticut, yeah. so then, trust me, we had some out there. <laughs> like uh, tricorn hat. Yeah, in closet. where you had like this little reenactment, and all your you know friends are all those out there like they're, they're, they're marching down, they're mm-hmm. shooting fake gun smoke. Now listen, obviously this is way better looking than that, but it's just like I'm seeing it, but I'm not really. I don't feel like I'm there or involved with it. Same part, Ryan. Uh, you know, obviously the D Day. You feel like you're in the middle of it with them, right? Yeah. You feel like you're right there. The bullets are going by your head. The people next to you are exploding. Like, it was so visceral for me, where for me, while the tension is there and the music and everything, I never felt that visceral feeling hmm. that I think movies like St. Pride Ryan or movies like Platoon really kind of gave to me. And I do think part of it is the fact that you don't really see the enemy. There's only so many times I hear a plane coming and everyone just ducks down. <laughs> ducks down. A couple people get blown up, then everyone stands back up and yeah. is like, oh, let's carry on here. Like, I, it was, I just never feel that tension, really. Like, after a while, I can only... Just hearing it only takes so much. Yeah, hearing a plane, a plane buzz by and everyone just drop to the ground doesn't really... I don't know. It doesn't. But that's supposedly, a, you know, playing devil's advocate. That's putting you in the shoes of those characters. It's yeah, they're like, just desensitized. It's just to this. It. It, you've been yeah. uh, desensitized, and it's this uh, mm-hmm. inescapable uh, rhythm of plane coming, duck, da- die, get down, sh- mm-hmm. uh, bullets whizzing at you. Another person dies. Like yeah. they, it, you were put in the same position as them. But it is so interesting because every movie, a war movie, a comic book movie, a rom-com, like you're experiencing it through 
a character who you get to know, like through a main character. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And and short of, you know, old British guy on the boat, um, who you got a little bit of. Uh, oh, we'll talk about the boat stuff. Some of that did not work for me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you know, character is what grounds your experience, and I think that is what gets you personally involved in it. And uh, and you experience the events of a film through a character's eyes, and the fact that he didn't. Do that. I don't know. It's just fa- it, that's why I say it's fascinating. Yeah, like I, I have to feel like that was intentional. I respect the more movie than I like it, and I, I agree with you. Like I watched it, and I was like, "Wow, this is beautiful." There's some shots in there. There's some things he was doing with like you know, just the camera work and the scope of it. I was like, "Wow, this is so impressive." I just wish I cared more. Was more invested. I understand the ticking clock soundtrack. I, I don't know. It didn't all work for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, let's get to the boat thing. <laughs> the kid falling down the stairs, like because. <laughs> Silly Murphy has like a mini breakdown and all of a sudden like he's dead a couple of minutes. Every time they went back to that boat, I was like, what's happening here? You know what? Boats uh, were are unsafe today and were even un- less safe <laughs> yes. in the past. You always okay. have to be careful walking around a boat. And that's the big takeaway from Dunkirk for me is yeah. uh, if you're on a boat, wear a helmet. And I get he lets uh, – this is spoilers – City, if you guys have not seen Dunkirk, uh, he lets Silly Murphy go at the end because I guess he's like a hey, soldier, he's been through enough. But he, I mean, he still killed that kid, he pushed him down. I guess it was an accident, was manslaughter. But what else happened on that boat? Like, did nothing else happen on that boat except for them sailing and picking up Silly Murphy and they pick up the soldiers? The, I wish he didn't just concentrate on that one boat because apparently hundreds and hundreds of boats went to save all those people. Yeah, they kind of came never, out of nowhere at the end. I never felt that scale, I never felt like everyone jumped on their boat. You saw a few boats here and there. I, I don't know. It just didn't you know, work for me. It's the thing of like uh, in worse action movies uh, before the doomsday event or before the bomb goes off, there's always the ticking clock. Yeah. You know, oh, we only have nine minutes left. Like in this one, entire subplots were ticking clocks. Mm-hmm. He was a, a, a ticking clock. Uh, Tom Hardy was a ticking clock. The uh, yeah. the uh, older uh, British captain talking about, Kenneth you know, Brana? how long they have until the Germans show up yeah. as a ticking clock. It was like the 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 terror of time was like the sub the character of this movie was time is just this malevolent thing yeah. that was never on your side. Well, speaking of time, uh, mercifully n- short for n- Christopher Nolan. Well, yes, movie. but Nolan also can't j- doesn't love st- you know he memento the shit out of this a little bit. <laughs> the, <laughs> there's, uh, there's three different stories telling in different times. I I I, I would be admit like 30, 40 minutes of film I was like what what the I was like where time I got a little lost in? at points. Yeah, yes. like I think rewatch <laughs> will definitely help with that. Yeah. But at the same time, it was distracting to the movie to me. Mm -hmm. Like, I get what he was doing, and I get how he played. He loves playing with time. He's that in all his movies. But I think if he would have just told this, I don't know, maybe as just a linear film. Like, I mean, I think it works for movies like Pulp Fiction. Obviously, Memento works perfectly backwards more than it probably does forwards. But for me, I just felt like I don't know if he needed that trick into this movie. I think he's just too used to that. Unless I'm missing some alternate story purpose for the for the timelines. I think his just his style of filmmaking that by now we kind of know who he is at this point is he makes puzzle boxes, you know, mm-hmm. that the that the viewer that's why he has such obsessive fans I think and that's why people keep rewatching his movies. A because they're beautiful, but B because there's always something to figure out. Like there's something uh, under the it, surface, there's something to plot out on a on a chart and to yeah. rearrange, and then to like set in place and be like, "Oh, now I get it." Uh, I think he's just in that habit of like, I I can't just tell a story with the beginning, yeah. middle, and end. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but like, why not? Like, that's the thing is when I watched the movie, I felt like I see. I know you like to do this stuff, and you did it in this movie. After watching this a second or third time, I don't know if that's it's going to feel less less necessary to me. Mm-hmm. I'm like, you didn't have to do this. Mm-hmm. You you could tell a straightforward, old fashioned kind of war film, and I mean, I feel like he did it because he wanted to be different, not because the story asked for it. I just uh, the thing is like, he's someone who at this point, uh, whether uh, whether you like him or not, um, you can't say that he isn't extremely meticulous and intentional in everything he does in his movies. Oh, for sure. Like, like just watch it. There's a great video. I don't know if it's part of a larger one, but where he diagrams out uh, the timeline of Memento, and mm-hmm. it's how it's this U curve, and there's all these corresponding moments on the top part of the curve and the bottom part of the curve, and it, it's really cool. It's really interesting. But that's where you're like, wow, this guy thinks through everything. So. This is probably not fair, and maybe I am overthinking it, but the fact that I don't get it 
just makes me think that like I'm missing something, not that hmm. oh he's he made a dumb choice. Okay. Now, I mean that listen, that could be it's one of those things where I do need to watch it again. And I don't want to act like I hate this movie. I may sound like very negative again. I enjoyed watching it for the pure spectacle and the scale yeah. of it. Seeing it in the IMAX theater was pretty amazing. I mean, you saw it at home? Yeah. I sat, I mean, <laughs> but I sat very close to the television yeah. to stimulate the experience. And it's one of those movies <laughs> where I wonder if I'm gonna like like it less on a smaller screen. Like, to the scale of it was such a big reason why I liked it and forgave some of the problems I have with the movie. You take that away, yeah. kind of like Avatar. I think a lot of people, once you took that off the big 3D screen, definitely it became much more... And I'm not saying this movie is simple as that. This movie is not like, you know, a lot of people say Avatar was just, what, Fern Gully and Dance with Wolves transitioned to a 3D. big 3D movie. Yeah, I don't think this is that. I just think once you take that scale away, that awe factor... I'm going to sit there and I'm just going to be like, oh, the stuff in the boat doesn't really work for me. Um, this time stuff doesn't really seem necessary. And well, again, as someone who saw it on a 55-inch television, but again, okay. sitting very close, yeah. um, it, uh, it it was visually awe-inspiring, but also a movie that I can't see myself like running back to watch again. Yeah, It was definitely an experience. Glad I had it, but I would rewatch most of his films before I'd throw that one back on. That That's the thing. It wasn't... Even Interstellar, which I have a lot of problems with, yeah. I saw twice. Yeah. Because I was like, I need to kind of wrap my head around it. <laughs> Whereas, like, I didn't feel that way after seeing Dunkirk. I was like, I watched it. I got it. Yeah. You know, Glad I you got that out of your system. Yeah, I don't feel like I need to run out and say, now listen, I have a 120-inch projector. So I feel like when I do watch this again, I'll still get Dang, some JT of that JT just, like, scale. mic dropped right there. <laughs> what? How many inches? 120 inches. Woof. Yeah. It's you amazing. hear that? That was him just <laughs> flopping it out on the table. 120 <laughs> inches, man. I mean, divide that, and you'll get what flopped on the table. But still, <laughs> it's uh, – projector changed my movie-going life. Uh, I had a 65-inch, like, LED TV. Yeah. And when I just took my projector, and I – literally drilled it to the ceiling so like i could pull it down in front of my tv it's an amazing setup everybody mm. uh, i wish you uh, buy a projector they're like 900 dollars. Uh, the screen was 120 bucks see I, I know i said i was lunch rich i don't know if i'm projector rich <laughs> you know <laughs> work my way up it was a life it was a life choice i'll give you that <laughs> i had to sacrifice some things but i will say like watching that movie on a projector you know will still give me some of that awe-inspiring cinematography and all that stuff um yeah and i was really excited because and I was ready for Nolan to give me a more traditional movie. I'm Interstellar, like, I literally was ready for him to come back down to Earth. Yeah. Because that movie was like, I like a lot of ideas in that movie, but it was just kind of a mess, especially the ending. And I was like, dude, I can't wait to see a straightforward Nolan movie. Mm. Like, let's just see you do a straightforward movie. So when His, I, I don't think, I think you're. He can't do it. It's not that he can't do it. I he, think he's, he's not, interested. not interested in doing it. He's, yeah. uh, he's always got. A, a trick up his sleeve. Um, he's not a straightforward filmmaker. And that is, uh, whether you enjoy it or not, that's reason alone to always keep coming back and to see what he's going to do next. That yeah. keeps it interesting for oh, me. Oh, I'll always see a Nolan film. Yeah. That's the thing. Like, even though if I don't like everything he does, I mean, I'm going to go see his movies because he's doing something different. Yeah, I've, I've, I've made my work. peace with Nolan. I think that the uh, it's all about the expectations you bring into it. And if mm -hmm. you're expecting a character-driven uh, ex uh, thing that just s feels like these are all natural human beings that you'd meet on the street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, like, if you're waiting for Chris Nolan to make Lady Bird, like, you're going to die. Yeah, um, I, I'm not looking for Lady Bird. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, something at the scale of Dunkirk. Yeah. Like, I like that he was tackling something like that, but... I didn't have to. I if going in. I didn't think I was gonna have to worry about those tricks. I didn't think I was gonna have to worry about. Oh, when's this happening at this time? Mm -hmm. Like I was. I didn't prepare myself for that whole memento. You know, pretzel. The hell yeah. he did in that movie. So like, I guess part of me was a little disappointed at that point. And again, if it worked for me, I wouldn't have cared as much. But like I said, it just didn't work for so much. Didn't work so much for me. Mm -hmm. But again, Dunkirk. A lot of people seem to love it. Uh, I have some friends that absolutely love it. I have some friends who don't like it. And I'm in the middle. I'm like, it's fine. It was good. It was good for what it was. Uh, Tom Hardy is the only character I really cared about. And because it's Tom Hardy. <laughs> like, yeah, it's Tom that's Hardy. The only with, reason. Uh, with his uh, half his face covered, mm -hmm. He's, he knows his yep. <laughs> his best moves. And mm -hmm. he, was, he was doing all of them, uh, mumbling into a, a face mask. Yeah. Let me say another thing. The boat scene where these three, four, five guys are hiding in a boat. Mm. Um, 
I need to watch it again, but like I remember thinking to myself, like, okay, they're waiting for the tide. I yes. thought so. I thought that was so they could like push the boat out. They never got out and pushed the boat. When well, they just didn't gunfire kind of interrupt well, a them? couple times there, there was some gunfire. <laughs> but the thing was, I was like, I didn't. All of a sudden, they were in the middle of the ocean, <laughs> and that I was boat? like, how the hell did they get to the middle of the ocean? The tide came in. I know, but like I just they, the movie never showed the actual boat going out. You're always just in there with them, correct? I don't remember because that's when they find out. Spoiler alert! Like that uh, one yeah. guy is, is French, French, and they kick yeah. him out. I assumed he got out and pushed. <laughs> that's the thing is like I remember at one point like when did they get on the ocean? I was like, yeah. I know they were there are soldiers shooting at him, and now they're in the ocean. There's someone else shooting at him, um, and I kind of get it. Like they're confused as you are. Like you're kind of in their boots, so you're like you don't know what's going on out there. No, you just know someone's shooting at us. Um, yeah, so some of that stuff just didn't work for me. I really want to watch this movie again. Okay. Like, I, I'll be honest with you. Like, now that's time passed. I wasn't running out to theaters to see it again. Yeah. Uh, but I would just like to see if some of these things that bothered me the first time, maybe my expectation was in the wrong spot. Maybe I'll like it a little bit better. I mean, there's some beautiful shots. When that plane is just gliding down at the very uh, end. Gorgeous, yeah. Yeah, and, like, Tom Hardy lands. And, I mean, amazing. Like, s- wallpaper, screensaver, <laughs> beautiful-looking shots. Um so I respect me for that stuff, and that's kind of why I want to revisit it because I do have the big screen, and I would just like to like vast in the glory of the cinematography. Mm-hmm. I just wish I cared more about somebody in that movie. Yeah, I'm just trying to uh, trying to explain it in a way that defends the choice, just out of you know mm-hmm. a challenge. It's like, is it that the theme of the event itself was like regular nameless people? going and putting their lives on the line to go save people they'd also never met with all these uh but then again like then why wasn't the whole movie about the uh the fleet of civilian ships it's funny because when every time they went to the beach i didn't feel the the urgency i think i was supposed to feel Mm. i always felt like i think these guys are constantly under attack they're constantly getting killed they're being torpedoed but everyone on the beach just seems so desensitized to it that I was well, that's just, just British like, people. Yeah, okay. uh, they that's are British so people. good at standing in line and, <laughs> and, true. and being <laughs> politely silent, no matter what is going on around them. This is a true testament to the British ability to queue up, as they yeah, say. Now you're talking about like Revolutionary War, where they just stood the where line. They, they and like, love march. lines. <laughs> yeah, march to gunfire. <laughs> horrible <laughs> violence happening around them. Yeah, a British person will stand there, stay in their place. Yeah, that's interesting. Like I, I guess. I never felt the urgency that I wanted to feel. Like I said, hearing guns, hearing planes buzz by, just, I was like, okay, this doesn't scare me. After a while. If I was at that beach, I wouldn't even feel that bad. I'd be like, all right, there's a chance, there's one out of a hundred, this thing's going to hit me. Yeah. So everyone just duck down and see what happens. Yeah, could have used a little more of like the the opening sequence, which I loved. Dude, um, yes. uh, Of, you know. The gunfire, right? The gunfire. When he's going to take a shit. Yep. (laughs) That, to me, I was like, when that movie started, I was like, oh, man, this is scary as shit. Yeah, when they're making their way through the town, even before that. um, Oh, my God, yes. And then you get the, uh, the, um, just uh, wordless storytelling where they get the uh, propaganda, the, the propaganda poster. And it's like, yeah. you're surrounded. That That's all you need to know. That first, like, five, ten minutes of that movie, I was like, oh, my God, this movie's going to be amazing. Like, this is yeah. the tension I'm going to feel. I never felt like the movie quite matched that, except for maybe the very ending when all three stories are intertwining and happening at once. Mm-hmm. And it's like, <laughs> first of all, the drums are there to remind you that it's really <laughs> intense. And whatever, the ticking clock. So, like, that moment when they all gets together then i was like oh well this is getting intense yeah but, that's why i say that this was uh, i think earlier on like that this was like an experimental film it was like watching someone see how much you could do with how with so little like how little you could put into a movie yeah. to tell the biggest story possible and it was just so sparse in mm-hmm. storytelling to see what could come of that and i that's why i say like it's tough to evaluate it as good or bad. I'm fascinated by it. I'm mm-hmm. glad it exists. I really enjoyed uh, the experience, and I really enjoyed thinking about it. But then, like, yeah, there's there's so many movies and stories that got me more involved. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I think it just comes down to, you know, what you were looking for going into it and then accepting it for what it is once you finally see it. Yeah, but it, good for him because he's just maintained, you know, since Batman at least, mm-hmm. is just being a... Mega budget indie filmmaker. <laughs> Mega like, budget. Good point. Um, so, real quick, let's move on from Dunkirk. Yeah. And let's just talk. I'm curious, like, what are some of your favorite war films? Just oh, war off films. the top of your head. Like, because the thing about Dunkirk, 
I love a good war movie. There's we're as we're recording, there's a movie called Twelve Strong yeah. coming out, which I'm not super excited for. Uh, it looks like it could be okay. Uh, Chris Hemsworth, Michael Shannon, Michael Pena has a good cast. Yeah. Uh, but are movies like that, like Lone Survivor, um, his past few years, what else we had? Like we mentioned Hacksaw Ridge. Mm. Uh, I feel like there was definitely like a resurgence for a while. Uh, Black Hawk Down. Uh, there's some really good ones. Like, just give me some let's, – let's stay away from like the 80s and like – 70s. Let's let's oh, keep Apocalypse uh, Now. I was gonna say, yeah. I was gonna go straight to Apocalypse That's Now. That's what I'm saying. Like, let's go into the more modern war movies. I'm like, trying to think. let's try to go m- mid 90s on. Because like, I think war is is dumb and boring and mostly and violent in okay. not a cool way. So I like so, but movies are so rare that approach it from that angle. Like my mm-hmm. favorite war thing is Jarhead. Okay, uh, yeah, the, Sam the HBO. Uh, I think it was on HBO originally, right? Well, no, it was a movie. It went to theaters. Sam Mendes directed it. Uh, oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, well, Jake, you saw with Jake Gyllenhaal, correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but where it's like <laughs> just you're just like going crazy from boredom. Yeah, <laughs> and like that. Uh, yeah. that's like oh wait, that doesn't glamorize war. That's like what it is like. It's a lot of downtime and then and then horrific violence and then downtime. <laughs> um, so I, I'm trying to think of of examples that approach it in like maybe a different way. I because I do have to go back to to find the ones that I really loved, which is like. Bridge on the River Kwai. Okay, um, that's old uh, school. Gallipoli. Uh, uh, Glory? You know, I don't think I've seen Glory. You haven't seen Glory? No. Oh, man. The Lo- Patriot. You know, I, <laughs> whatever. They're like superhero movies. Yeah, that's uh, the 90s. The, um, John Wayne movies and stuff like that. I, I think that uh, uh, war, a well-told war movie should either be about like the psychological effects of it on people, mm-hmm. like uh, uh, coming home or something like that, or, like, um, or something that really captures how shitty it is <laughs> have you seen platoon yes all right yeah. well, that's to me that's maybe my favorite war film yeah uh because again vietnam war was not good guys versus bad guys no it's very much a messy war and it was about how much we were fighting each other as much as we were fighting the enemy yeah i think world war ii spoiled us in real life and in in pop culture of like there were clear good guys versus bad guys mm-hmm. and then like Pretty much every other conflict, it's been a little, it's a little yeah, yeah. A little <laughs> column A, a little column B. And yeah. I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, war movies can do great work out of World War II, but it, you take it anywhere else and, like, you're, it's just not so black and white. Well, what do you think about some of the more recent ones? Like, have you seen Lone Survivor? No. Okay. Peter Berg, Mark Wahlberg. Okay. I think it was a little too Hollywoodized, mm. which I think could be something that happens in movies that could be kind of ugly yeah. when it comes to war films. I don't want you to... Just don't Hollywood it up too much, uh-huh. which I'm worried 12 Strong might, just from the trailers, <laughs> sure, might yeah. do. But I'm not going to judge it. I haven't seen it. Uh, did you see American Sniper? No, I never did. Wow. Okay. I Interesting. Did. You didn't see American Sniper? Because that's movie. It just I, doesn't seem like it's something I'd like. So I know I'm prejudging it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but uh, what can I say? Like, I, it, I, I saw that fake baby and I was like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fake baby's in for 30 seconds. <laughs> So, like, that movie, because that movie made a crap load of money. Yeah. Uh, Bradley Cooper, I think, almost got, did he get nominated for Best Actor that year for that? Good question. He might have. He was in the running. Um, So, like, there's a marketplace for these kind of movies. Yeah. Uh, And then, you see Clint Eastwood has another film coming out, I think, next month about the real life. He does, yeah. He always does. Yeah. (laughs) Good point. (laughs) It's about the guys who had uh, stopped a train attack. um, And they got the actual guys to star in the movie. Interesting gambit. Yeah. Um, (laughs) see how that pays off <laughs> yeah i think to me like a, a uh i like zero dark 30 love um, zero dark 30 yeah. one of my favorites uh, i think it was my number one movie of the year it came out yeah and i think like uh, the vibe of a war movie should be something more like sicario like a drug war movie oh interesting to me, yeah it, well, Oscar. It is more interesting of um uh that just paints it as like horrific and scary mm-hmm. and and full of uh good and bad people on all sides uh, rather than like let's go chaps over the hill well let me ask this what didn't you you said earlier you didn't really like hacksaw ridge yeah what didn't you like about it besides the fact it's for us going to war well, yeah that's which i get the, i get the beginning is a little cheesy it's a well little it's the corny. beginning it's the beginning the beginning is a little corny and cheesy yes. i'm with you on that but for me once he actually joins the boot camp and goes to vietnam I mean, it's violent. Maybe I think people could argue a little excessively, but I think that's how Gibson does it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I still enjoyed the movie overall. I, Vince Vaughn, I actually really liked in the movie. Yeah, he was fine. <laughs> um, 
I think that uh, it was his. It was like his southern accent was ridiculous. Oh, really? Okay, uh, it didn't bother me that much. Um, and it was uh, just the. It was the tonal shift from the aw shucks, PG beginning to. Okay. And I know this was based on real life, but yeah, it's like yeah. really pick up a fucking gun. <laughs> like, you're, like you're helping other yeah, people kill minute, people. This guy did not pick up a gun. <laughs> you know, it's not like a story flaw I, I in the script. <laughs> I was annoyed. <laughs> you're just bluthers. You're like, just pick no, up I'm just like, you want point. it both ways. Like, okay, because mm-hmm. you know, like I, uh, uh, patched up this guy so that he could shoot somebody. Like mm-hmm. I'm blameless. Like that. It's not how it works, but interesting. <laughs> okay. So you just have a problem with the actual, <laughs> I think I have a problem with the, <laughs> Yeah. So you just have a problem with the way he looks his life there okay I will say this like there were things in the movie and I said this earlier I don't like when Hollywood like Hollywoodizes things Mm -hmm. it's like there were several times that movie where I said that shit didn't happen Mm -hmm. and then in the end credits they're like that happened yeah wow like the part where you cover the guy's face with dirt yeah and like I was like oh that uh, probably didn't happen that's the (laughs) Hollywood and I'm like holy crap no that shit happened it's so, unbelievable. Our uh, our grandparents could kick all of our asses several times over. Oh, for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, th- there's some smaller war films I feel like don't get a lot of recognition. Do you ever see Casualties of War? No. Michael J. Fox, Brian De Palma, Sean Penn, okay. John Ogazamo. Very difficult movie to watch. Uh I know we want to get into the plot, really, but like it's Michael J. Fox saying, "Hey, I could be an Oscar-winning actor," uh, and he's good in it. Yeah, but you still see Jamie—I mean, not Jamie Fox. That's you see Jamie, Jamie Fox. Fox. You I see mean, Michael, Michael Jamie Fox. J. <laughs> the J stands for Jamie. It's Cuba Gooding Jr. Missile Crisis. All <laughs> uh, uh, no, Michael J. Fox is him really trying to give like I feel like. I could be a real serious Yeah, actor. but you can see the effort. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Sean Penn I do like in it, and I think Brian De Palma does a good job directing the film. Uh, there's other films. Hamburger Hill is like a really old-school 80s okay. Vietnam War film. Have you ever heard of that? No. Okay, see, I could, I love war movies. Yeah. So I could go into Clearly, it. Clearly, we've hit on your, uh, your uh, pet genre here. Black Hawk Down. No, yeah, love Black Hawk Down. Love Black Hawk Down. Okay. Not, I mean, come on, it's awesome. Yeah, it is. I remember watching it. Even some people have said this about the film in the past, like they couldn't tell who was who at times because they're all. Well, just, but that was before that became a trope. Like that was yeah. actually kind of a fresh way to uh, the handheld stuff was just getting yeah. popular at that time. Yeah, and I think the actress was all in shaved heads. Orlando, I mean, the cast in that movie, Eric Bana, uh, Tom Hardy's in there. Mm-hmm. Um, Ewan McGregor. Yeah. Orlando Bloom. Uh, I can't remember. This. I mean, Tom Sizemore, of course. Yes. It's a war film. Uh, so yeah, I think that movie has a fantastic cast. It still really holds up. Really, Scott just knows how to shoot his shit up. Yep. It looks fantastic. Uh, I'm trying to think, is there any other war movies Top that pop Gun, your head? Obviously. Top Gun's not a war movie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they start World War Three at the end of that one. Okay. They shoot down some Russian planes, and it's like, all right, uh, credits roll. Okay, I guess we're fine. Um, okay. Uh, any other ones pop in your mind that you really enjoyed? Gosh. No, it's just not my... Uh, uh, I not feel bad. It's, it's just not my forte, okay. exactly. All right, you're not a big war guy. Uh, you know what? I'm a peace man. I'm, peace, I'm a peaceful man. <laughs> I like my war uh, uh, to either be uh, so hor- so horrifically realistic that it doesn't make for a good movie. Okay, you know what? Fair enough. Uh, I love war films because I love action movies. Sure. And it's, it's like, not like an action movie, but JT. That's, but that's the thing. It gives you the action taste, but it gives you the drama and the levity of like a really good drama. Mm. I mean, like I love Face Off. But they ain't gonna win no yeah. Oscars. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Yeah, I love. You know, I loved as uh, again. Uh, the, this is what I was thinking of. Although I do love Jarhead. Um, was uh, the Pacific? Uh, oh yeah. Well, Band of Brothers and Band of Brothers is yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's probably the my favorite. It's I can't call it a movie. We can but call like, it a movie. I, it's, it's a story split into ten episodes. It's one story split into ten episodes. Then that's like, like a, probably my favorite war movie yeah. of all time because most movies you get two and two and a half hours to get to know a character. In a war movie, they're probably going to die. Yep. When you get to know a character for eight hours. Oh, it's like Game of Thrones. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's Game of Thrones and World War II. So it's like, for me, the more you're attached to a character, the more those losses mean more. Yeah. So by the end of Band of Brothers, when somebody dies, you're so much more attached than you would in a movie like Saved Private Ryan. And totally. when Vin Diesel bites it in about 20 minutes into yeah. the movie. So for me, yeah, Band of Brothers. The Pacific was good, but not as good as Band of Brothers, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, did you, can, do, do that's you think, fair. Do you think they're level, or would you put one above? I, I I thought that they were like consistent quality. Really, through, right yeah. on top of each other. Yeah. Interesting. Maybe I should rewatch Pacific. Yeah. Because that is a much different 
war than what mm-hmm. you see in Banner Brothers also. And that's what I love about World War II. There, it was fought in so many different parts of the world. One could say it was worldwide. <laughs> the, of course. <laughs> I hate to I hate to say that one thing I love about World War II <laughs> is probably the worst. My favorite part yeah. was uh, uh, Dachau. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I like how you can tell different stories in totally different settings. Uh, Thin Red Line. Yeah. It's a great movie that tells a totally different aspect of that war. Totally. That like feels nothing like any other World War II film I've really seen before. Because it took place in a whole different part of the world. And yeah, so for stuff like that, I think that's what makes World War II. This is one of those movies. It's one of those wars that movies are just always going to be made of. Mm-hmm. You're always going to go back to that. And same thing with Vietnam because of wh- how different it was from all the other wars. Yeah, and it really fit 70s filmmaking. It was like the perfect oh war for God, the perfect, perfect time in, in, in film. Totally. And I do think you should check out Glory. Okay. If I want to walk away from this episode saying one thing. Check out Glory. Watch Glory. Denzel Washington, I believe he wants Best Supporting Actor for that. I've heard so many good things about it. Yeah. It's, it's stupid that I haven't seen it. Carrie Elways, Matthew Broderick, Morgan Freeman. Okay. Like, it's really good. Edward Zwick. Edward mm-hmm. Zwick, I Ed think Zwick, is yeah. Brown's name, uh, directed it. One of the best scores by James mm. Horner. Me and Ken Napsok, like, bonded Rock over out, our love score. for the glory score. <laughs> well, I just remember because I used to listen to that score on my uh, cassette player back in the day. And I would just, it's one of the first scores I would just listen to. Okay. And uh, I remember telling Ken about it, and he's like, oh, my God. Yes, same thing. <laughs> uh, it's very much... Yeah, and it fits perfectly into the movie. Okay. So check out Glory. Guys, if you out there haven't seen Glory, also check it out. Uh, I think it's one of those movies that doesn't get mentioned too much. Like, it's not in the pop culture. No one's like, Glory. No, a rare Glory <laughs> shout-out. But I, but I have heard about it throughout my entire life. So it's uh, time has come. Let's all watch Glory. Let's all be better people and watch Glory. <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, all right, man, I think that's going to do it. We had a lot of good war talk. Uh, I got to talk through some of my problems with Dunkirk. Uh, I was... I love hearing different people's opinions on this movie because, like I told you, all my friends have, they're all on a different end of the spectrum. Love, hate, okay. And you seem to be in the middle? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, good, bad. I, I'll, I'll say good because it's different and I like different things. Okay. Fair enough. I think that's a that's a fair way to describe the movie. It's different, so I like it. Yeah. I've seen stuff like that before. Where I'm like, you know what? I appreciate you did something different. Exactly. I didn't love um, Valerian and Planet but, of a Thousand, but it was different. so much different yeah. shit. I was like, I give you respect. I think you and me, just by nature of our work, and also the fans here who do it just purely out of the love, is like you see so many movies and yes. that you just have this inherent like disgust for formula and anything mm-hmm. that steps away from formula you're like you know what even if i don't like it i'm glad you did it i enjoy it when i was in uh <laughs> full on to my geek film geek spectrum and when i was in high school i started watching foreign films sure and the large reason was because they didn't follow a formula yeah hollywood has a formula oh yeah especially in the 90s so when i started watching foreign films in high school i said oh my god these guys don't they don't give a shit. They don't know. Yeah, <laughs> like they don't have a studio boss with a scar coming in. Be like, you got to make sure the kid lives at the end. Yeah. <laughs> like if I watched too many, I watched so many foreign films as a kid where the good guy died. I was like, wait a minute, what? This ain't supposed to happen. And what about the sequel? <laughs> yeah. Why is it Chang Fat walking away? Yeah. Alive in this movie, <laughs> he just got shot up to hell. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I, that's one reason I love foreign films, and that's one reason I do. Like you said, I I like movies that do something different and change things up. Yep. So, all right, guys. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Um, Spence, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me back, dude. Uh, this is your second time? Second right? time. That's right. We'll have you on more because you right. work in the same office as me. Yeah. And it, it makes it easier. I'm literally trapped in here with him. <laughs> um, once again, we're going to end this show with a few words from my buddy Ben, who is a Patreon supporter. Nice. And again, guys, if you go to Patreon, uh, it's Patreon slash JTE April Dawn. Uh, you could go on there. I give exclusive movie reviews, exclusive podcasts, exclusive a bunch of stuff. Do it. But most and of this all, this could be you. Yeah, this could be you. So he's he actually watched Mother. Oh, another movie that I defend that you, for being different. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> it fits perfectly into this episode. A movie that I watched, and I maybe just like you, I didn't like Mother. Yeah, but I respected it. Exactly. I said, you know what. You did exactly the same way I feel Christopher Nolan made the movie he wanted to make with yes. Dunkirk. I feel like Aronofsky made the movie he wanted to make. And I think that should be celebrated a little bit in today's Hollywood. That, But it, like some other movies, it could go wrong sometimes. Yes. 
This but I'd rather see an ambitious failure than Pirates 5. The, yes, ex- exactly. Pirates 5 is a movie I saw <laughs> in, an hour later. In one year, out the other. I cannot remember a single thing about the movie. Yeah, so. the, my popcorn dump lasted longer than my memories <laughs> of, of uh, Pirates 5. <laughs> popcorn dump sounds painful. <laughs> um, all right, guys, so let's get, kick it off to Ben with a few thoughts on the movie. Mother! Mother! Movie I not so much with. Mother! The David Aronofsky movie. I know I was, I'm meant to see it, but I saw it over the holidays. I watched it on demand because I was sick. So I popped it on. I heard all the records about it. I need to check it out for myself. I watched it, and it was weird. I got what everybody was saying. Yes, it was an allegory. Yes, it was a metaphor. Yes, it was a little bit too much. But I didn't hate it. I didn't love it. It was a pretentious movie, but I don't know. I I, I don't want to say I had fun with it, but I took it for what it was, I watched it, I saw it, I took in my inner thoughts, and what I came up with, it was an okay movie, but the metaphor was too much for me. The certain scene at the end with the pay me, not going to give anything away, but that scene was a little much for me to handle. Some people might have liked it. I did not. I'm happy I didn't see this in the theater. I'm happy I watched it in my house on my own. But, yeah, I, if I had to score it, I gave it a 7.5 out of 10. It for what the movie was, it was really well made. Kind of my kind of movie that I would normally see, but there was so much hype about it. I'm checking it out, and it was really well done. So, and Jennifer Lawrence, she was the main star, so they have me about them. They were great in their, when, uh, in their characters, Mother, Mother Nature, and the creator. Oh, and Michelle Pfeiffer was great, and Harris was great, Normal Creation was great. All the acting was great in this movie, actually. Which is a little surprising, but... Yeah, Mother. Weird ass movie, kind of dug it, didn't hate it. It was meh. It, it was meh, I liked it. I liked it a little for it not to be meh. Well, that was my little small review. Thank you so much for picking me to see it. And I hope I'm happy to support you. I'm happy to be a Patreon for you. And I hope to do this again. I also do little movie reviews. But that's for another time. Alright, well, thank you for picking me. And I hope this helps. Have a good day and Happy New Year.